So today we're going to discuss our second majority rule, our bodies are respected. Um, and to do that, we have three main goals for our time together. The first is that leaders know what the status of abortion access is one year after the Dobbs decision, Spoken, sorry, focusing specifically on how Black folks are disproportionately affected, as well as the current fight for mifepristone. Um, we also want leaders to analyze their own personal resources and how they can use those resources to support abortion access, because we all have a role in this fight. And then we also want leaders to feel the gravity of the situation regarding abortion access after Dobbs and are empowered to create a world where our bodies are truly respected. Awesome. Okay. So to do that tonight, we have five things. We're about to wrap up our opening. I'm going to talk for a second about what it means for our bodies to be respected and why we like deeply care about that at Supermajority. Um, we're going to talk also what um, the landscape looks like one year after Dobbs. And we have three incredible speakers that are going to take up the majority of our time tonight, which is great because they are so wonderful. Um, and then we will close out our time together. If you are a visual learner, which I am, Brittany, it's like you were queued up for this. We're about to drop the worksheet for tonight into the chat. It's a PDF, so you can um, actually like edit it directly if you just pull it up. And we'll get that into the chat for you. Okay. Any questions as we dive in? Cause we're just like about to start and dive into what it means for our bodies are respected. Um, I'm going to check the chat for just one second. Perfect. Okay. So when we say our bodies are respected, we mean that the healthcare system takes our needs seriously from medical treatment to making decisions about if and when to start a family. And as we begin our discussion of majority rule number two, um, we're going to begin with a framework that doesn't have to do just with the legal right to abortion, but about the practical barriers that people, especially Black, Indigenous, people of color, face in accessing abortion care and all reproductive health services. Open your on mute. I'm on mute. So um, <laughs> when we talk about abortion access, we really have to reckon um, with the way that the early repro rights movement upheld and compounded white supremacist values. Um, this is largely due to the fact that it focused heavily on the right to contraception for white women only. And today this history has shaped a reproductive uh, freedom movement that often focuses too heavily on the right to legal abortion and not enough on what barriers exist to access all parts of reproductive care, even in places where abortion is legal. And that's uh, especially true for communities of color. So we want to be really clear that when we are talking about rule number two, our bodies are respected, that we center racial justice. Um, and a few more things that we are going to speak pretty explicitly about abortion tonight, which I know can bring up some really charged feeling for, for folks. And I want to remind everyone about our norms and ask that we be mindful of experiences that might not be our own. This includes acknowledging that all genders need access to abortion care and that our communities may be affected differently um, by abortion bans. Yes. Okay. So thank you for that, Paloma. So as many of you know, just over one year ago, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. Um, and as a little background, 50 years ago in 1973, so it blows my mind, Supreme Court ruled on the landmark case Roe versus Wade, which established a constitutional right to abortion. And this ruling had struck down many laws that had banned and barred abortion in the state. Okay, so since then, since 1973, many people on this call know anti-abortion politicians and judges slowly chipped away at abortion access, implementing laws that made abortion access practically impossible. And the Dobbs decision last year effectively removed federal protections for abortion access and returned the power to legislate abortion rights to the state. Um, so now states have the power to decide who can and can't access abortion care, which you, you live in a fundamentally gerrymandered state where like a few people wield outsized power and against the will of the people, you know how particularly devastating this is. So many states already had laws on the books that said if Roe had, was ever overturned, they would immediately ban abortion. And states moved pretty quickly to restrict and ban abortions after the Dobbs decision. 
And now one year later, um, Dobbs has really drastically changed how and if people across the country access abortion care. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna read a few facts and I really wanna suggest sit with them because these are real people behind these numbers. Um, two things that I want us to focus on is the distance folks have to travel to receive basic health care um, and the dis disproportionate barriers uh, to access abortion care that are affecting Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So as many of us know, the need to travel for abortions has increased dramatically, and this in turn has increased the cost. What we've seen is that a third of women in the U.S. and even more um, non-binary and trans folks um, that are of reproductive age now face excessive travel times to obtain an abortion. Twice as many women and pregnant people must now travel more than an hour to reach an abortion provider. And residents of the South face the biggest jump in travel times. So what we saw before is that folks in Texas and Louisiana went from median travel times of roughly 15 minutes to obtain an abortion to trips more than six hours long after Dobbs. And in Texas, that average increase was eight hours. These increased barriers fall most heavily on folks of color, particularly black and indigenous folks. More than 60% of those who seek abortions are people of color and about half live below the poverty line. And many people of color, including the majority of black Americans live in Southern states with some of the most restrictive abortion laws. Black folks were hit the hardest by restricted access to abortion with 40% facing one hour drives after the decision compared to just 15% before. And nearly 40% of Native Americans already faced hour long drives and after Dobbs over half continue to do so. And then I wanna also just speak about the maternal health risks that also significantly um, are significantly higher among black and indigenous women um, than any other races and ethnicities in the United States. Oh, thanks Paloma. Great, so I know this is probably a lot to process. I just wanted to make it more personal too, because I know facts, sometimes they feel a little outside, or if you're part of those facts, you're like, that's me. That's like my experience. So we just wanted to ask if folks could drop a plus in the chat, if you've been personally affected by the loss of abortion access in your state, or if someone you love has been affected by the loss of access. Okay. Well, I just got the chills. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. It made me like automatically like tear up. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So depending on how you look, where you live, your proximity to care, we all experience this differently. And if you feel scared or if you feel hopeless, we're in this with you. Um, and we've seen how folks across the country have showed up for one another, despite not living in the same area. And you're going to hear a lot of ways to show up for folks tonight, no matter where you live. And if you're particularly like, I can't take action because I'm in a state with decreased access and I don't know what to do. Like you just get a B for a second and you get a B with people on this call that are for you. Um, okay, one final thing that we wanna talk about before we transition to the speakers. There's a particular aspect of access that is being threatened post Dobbs and that's medication abortion. It's particularly mifepristone. And so mifepristone is a two pill regimen that ends pregnancy up to 12 weeks in a self-managed way. It's incredibly safe. I love this. It's in, like safer than Viagra um, and accounts for 51% of all abortions. And it matters um, as states add barriers for people to get to clinics, access to medication abortion, particularly prescribed using telemedicine is important. And so what's happening with it in the courts is that there's a pending federal court case that would threaten access to mifepristone, blocking its usage entirely in the U.S., regardless of state laws. Um, and so we wanted to say that because um, it's continuing. <laughs> like, it's not just like one year ago and then there's like devastating consequences. There's like continued efforts to take away access to care, regardless of the state that you are in. And I want to say that because we all have a part to play in protecting abortion access and making a world where our bodies are truly respected. And hearing this information can sometimes make me feel hopeless, sometimes makes me feel spurred to action. And so on the worksheet, um, there's an exercise that's going to ask you to take an inventory of the resources you have currently to help folks across the country get access to care. Um, and as you listen to the speakers tonight, I want you to dial in particular to any actions they're asking you to take. 
Um, and we're going to close the call returning to an exercise where you can assess like the resources, the actions that you want to commit to and take tonight. And we hope that you see these resources you already have at your fingertips for yourself and for others. Um, but without further ado, we really want to move into our speakers. We want you to hear from them. I'm so excited. You're going to hear from three experts in the reproductive justice movement. Um, we are going to move around um, our speaking order just a little bit. Um, and so, Liz, I'm going to pass it on to you so you can introduce. Our yes. First speaker. Okay. We are honored to have this first speaker tonight. Get ready. They're so wonderful. Um, okay, we know that funding abortions is a powerful mutual aid action and a way that we can organize outside the system to fight back, specifically due to increased need to travel that Paloma just talked about. Um, so the National Network of Abortion Funds builds power with members to remove financial and logistical barriers to abortion access by centering people who have abortions and organizing at the intersections of racial, economic, and reproductive justice. So here with us tonight is Oriaku and Jaku. Um, they are a first-generation Black, Igbo, Nigerian-American. Um, they identify as Kentucky-raised, queer, fat, Southern femme. They're a healing-centered coach living and loving Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Oriaku is deeply committed to finding joy and pleasure in everything she does, including the work they do as an executive director of the National Network of Abortion Funds. Um, she believes radical joy is a core value that can be embodied and operationalized in movement spaces and truly believes that we can and will create a cultural shift around how we address abortion in the South um, and invites you to join her in making reproductive justice a reality. Okay, so with that, welcome Oriaki. We're so grateful to have you tonight. Um, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz and Paloma, for um, the introduction. And I want to start out by sharing my appreciation for sure, um, for Supermajority for creating this space. Um, I am deeply honored to be here among passionate and committed allies um, and fellow leaders in the reproductive justice movement at such a pivotal moment in a, for our movement. We are all here because we recognize the urgency of the crisis that we face. I continue to be concerned by how far people who do not stand for the fundamental freedom of their families, friends, and loved ones to make decisions of the right decisions about, about their lives and how they will go. Abortion is banned or restricted in more than 20 states across the United States. And as a result, people who already face astronomical barriers to access are being forced to jump through even more hoops and hustle even harder just to exercise their basic human right to autonomy. As a Black queer person living in the South, I know that my life and so many of our lives are intersectional. The overlapping systems of white supremacy and oppression are working exactly as they were meant to. And I want to emphasize there it's doing its job and using laws and institutions to control our bodies, families, and futures. We've seen time and time again that abortion bans and restrictions harm Black Indigenous communities or Black communities, Indigenous communities, people of color, and people experiencing financial hardship the most. This is not by accident, and this is not a coincidence. This is by design. And it is our responsibility to boldly name this truth because when we expose and challenge the structures that create and perpetuate these inequalities, we create the pressure necessary to disempower and dismantle them. But none of us can do that alone. We really need each other, particularly in this moment. And I cannot and will not shake my deep belief that we will dismantle the oppressive systems that can seek to control our bodies and our lives through unwavering commitments and unconditional love for one another. As the executive director of the National Network of Abortion Funds, I have the privilege of leading an organization that organizes networks of care for individuals seeking abortions. We are nearly comprised of or we're comprised of nearly 100 abortion funds that help relieve economic and logistical barriers for people seeking abortions, whether it's funding procedures, 
abortion pills, transportation, and lodging when travel is required, childcare, doula and emotional support, or other needs voiced by people seeking abortions, our funds are finding innovative ways and compassionate ways, deeply, deeply compassionate ways that are rooted in unconditional, radical, revolutionary love to get people the abortions that they want and they need. In doing so, these funds create networks of solidarity, counteracting the shame and judgment imposed by extremists that aim to control our reproductive choices. Our compassion and support in these challenging moments are just as crucial as meeting financial and logistical needs. Fundamentally, the work of abortion funds is mutual aid. Abortion funds challenge and defy the systems designed to oppress us. We organize outside the confines of a deeply flawed and broken system, refusing to be limited by its failures. We recognize that by charting our own course and meeting the needs of our communities, we will become a formidable force for transformational change. And I definitely see abortion funds as being that tidal wave of transformation in this next iteration of our movement in a post row era. Abortion funds have long navigated the difficult and evolving terrain of trying to get an abortion, which has set them up to lead in this moment. Even when abortion was legal, that did not mean it was accessible. Abortion funds have existed in communities for decades, but for too long, they have operated largely unseen by those who fail to see the intersectionality of this work, the power of community-rooted organizing, and the critical need for direct assistance in achieving reproductive justice. Yet the existence and resilience of abortion funds reminds us that we have the power to resist, to support one another, and to build the world that we envision. In a country and a world that seeks to marginalize and diminish the voices agency, dignity, and humanity of people living with marginalized identities, we can and must navigate these treacherous waters to create a future where every individual has the autonomy and agency to make decisions about their own body, health, and future. Collective action, unwavering solidarity, mutual aid, radical hope, and unconditional love is what it will take. And I know it might have sounded a little fluffy, but I definitely know this moment feels challenging, even in un insurmountable at times. But I hope all of you will join me in saying hell no to doom and gloom. Y'all, we must find joy in the spite and link arms with one another to achieve a future with reproductive justice and our collective liberation. And it may or may not be a surprise, but it's not always going to be easy. It won't happen overnight. And we can't do it alone. But what I will say is that it's going to take all of us and it will be so, 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 so worth it. Um, to end, follow us on at Abortion Funds on social media and check us out at abortionfunds.org to learn more about us and get involved with your local abortion fund by making a donation, signing up to be a volunteer, becoming a sustaining donor, or lending your skills and expertise. Honestly, there's an abundance of possibilities of how this can go. And I will say that even though I'm making the assumption that all of us are pro-choice in this space, we are also in choice. And so the decisions we make in this moment, how we choose to move, how we choose to be in relationship with one another will definitely be the thing that makes or breaks success in our attempt to win and get closer towards our collective liberation. So thank you all so much. Hell no to doom and gloom. I'm with it, Oriaku. Thank you so much. Um, I also attempt 
try my best to read with, lead with radical love. So I'm thankful that you mentioned that and I'm grateful to share space with you today. Um, we are now going to hear um, from Danielle Atkinson from Sister Song, um, which is probably one of my favorite organizations as well as the National Network of, I love all of these and please make sure that you're donating and supporting them. Um, so we are going to ground in the importance of reproductive justice as our path forward now and also reflect on how not using it has failed us and led us to where we are now post Dobbs. Um, Sister Song's mission is to strengthen and amplify the collective voices of indigenous women and women of color to achieve reproductive justice by eradicating reproductive oppression and securing human rights. Here tonight we have Danielle Atkinson and Kaylee is going to do us a favor of dropping her entire bio in the chat but I want to just share a little bit about her now. Danielle serves as the Georgia coordinator at Sister Song, an advocate for intersectionality. Danielle champions reproductive justice by empowering marginalized communities and building power in cross movement coalitions. Danielle has pioneered initiatives like the Sister Song Queer, Trans, and Women Bailout Program and the RJ the Vote campaign, actively challenging systemic injustices and promoting civic engagement. She's also worked on conferences like Let's Talk About Sex, which is probably one of my favorite convenings ever. And if you ever have the opportunity to go, I highly recommend it. Um, so with that, welcome, Danielle. Hi, how are you, everybody? I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Danielle Rodriguez. I'm not sure who Atkinson is, but maybe that'll be like my future partner or something. And then that'll be my last name. There we go. <laughs> Um, the sun is sunning. Um, I've tried to fix the blinds and it's, it's not working. So this is where we are. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you and th thanks for having me um, this evening. Um, I was asked to talk to you all about reproductive justice now and the path forward, which is an issue that's fundamentally important to the wellness and survival of our society. So reproductive justice encompasses the fundamental right of individuals to make decisions about their own bodies, including the right to access safe and legal abortion care. Autonomy and agency are the core of reproductive justice, recognizing that individuals should have the power to determine if, when, and how they choose to become parents. The right to access abortion care is a vital component of reproductive justice. It is not only about reproductive freedom, but also about human rights. All individuals, regardless of their race, gender, or socioeconomic status should have the right to control their reproductive lives, free from interference, coercion, or stigma. By centering the human rights to autonomy and access to abortion care, we acknowledge that reproductive justice is not just a matter of personal choice, but also a matter of social justice. It is about dismantling the barriers that prevent individuals from exercising their rights, particularly those who face intersecting forms of oppression and marginalization. And I just want to touch base here. When I say um, marginalization, I'm often talking about a community that I represent as well and communities that I uh, live in. Um, it is essential that we advocate for policies and laws that protect and expand access to safe and legal abortion. This includes the removal of unnecessary restrictions such as waiting periods, mandatory counseling, and targeted regulations that disproportionately impact marginalized communities. It is also involves ensuring that abortion services are affordable, available, and free from discrimination so that individuals can make informed decisions about their reproductive health without facing undue burdens. In addition to policy change, education and destigmatization efforts are crucial in the path forward. We must challenge the misinformation, myths, and stigma surrounding abortion care. By promoting accurate information, empathy, and understanding, we can foster a society that respects and supports individuals' reproductive decisions, including their decisions to have an abortion. Collaborations between healthcare providers, activists, and advocates are vital in advancing the human right to autonomy and access to abortion care. Together, we can work towards creating healthcare systems that ensure safe, compassionate, and judgment free care. This involves training healthcare professionals to provide comprehensive and respectful reproductive health care, including abortion services, and establishing networks of support for individuals seeking abortion care. In conclusion, the path to reproductive justice must recognize and uphold the human right to autonomy and access to abortion care. 
By embracing a Black feminist and healing justice lens, we can challenge the systems of oppression and stigma that hinder individuals' reproductive choices. Let us stand together to advocate for policies, education, and collaboration with each other that empower individuals to exercise their rights and access the care they need. You can find us at sistersong underscore WOC, Women of Color, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. My name is Danielle Rodriguez. Thanks. Danielle Rodriguez, I'm so sorry for <laughs> <it's okay. laughs> mishap. I'm not sure how that happened, but <laughs> so apologetic. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we are big fans of Sister Song um, and are grateful for being you're sharing some time with us today. Um, so you've heard from Oriaku, you've heard from Danielle, and we have to do all of these things and and continue to build grassroots power, keep making noise and organizing in our own neighborhood to elect folks that will change the system. Lillian's List recruits, trains, and supports progressive women who are champions of reproductive freedom and equity for women to run for public office down in North Carolina. With us tonight, our final speaker, Monica Talmadge. She has been involved in politics in some form or another since her first Democratic National Convention at just eight years old. She attended North Carolina A&T University, where she pursued a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. Since then, she has been a fierce advocate for civil rights, repro reproductive justice, and lifting her voice for folks who can often be heard. She has held leadership positions from precinct chair to the Democratic National Committee Woman for the Young Democrats of America. So with that, welcome, Montica. So glad to be connected with you again, and great to have you here. It is so good to be in space with all of you. I want to go, I want to start off really, really quickly by begging your indulgence. My voice doesn't normally sound like this, but I had an adorable little seven month old baby sneeze in my face this past weekend. And whatever crud he brought home from daycare, he gave it to his sweet auntie. So now I get to sound like my own version of Kathleen Turner. And, but I'm kind of excited about that because, you know, this kind of maybe, I, I, I'm just excited about being here in general. So maybe my voice won't go high and pitchy. It'll just go low and bitchy. I'm kind of excited about that. So let me start off by thanking the Super Majority Education Fund for asking me to even be in this space. Like, I'm geeked. I, when I got the email, I honestly thought it was going to the wrong person. I was like, oh, this can't be me. And then I double checked. And in fact, it was me. So I'm super excited about that. To my siblings in this work, the amazing and radiant Oriaku and the beautiful and radiant Danielle, the sun was shining on you, darling. So you were glowing and you were giving your energy. Both of you were just giving your energy. Hello, Daphne Glass. I, you guys are just amazing. I honor you. I honor your work and your tireless commitment to ensuring that our bodies and our lives and our choices are respected. So I just love you all so much for all of that. Um, and I also want to shout out in, a, in their absence, they may not be here, but I definitely want to lift in the room our amazing Lillian's List team. We always say that we are the Emily's List of North Carolina. So because we have such we have very similar um, we have very similar missions. We have very similar uh, value strains. So we are very much in uh, lockstep with them. <clears throat> so really quickly, I, I want to take a step back. I want to take a step back to. June the 23rd of 2022. And we had gotten the, the knowledge and we had, it had been leaked out the decision that was going to come down about Dobbs, but we weren't a hundred percent sure what was going to happen. We still kind of, I think in those moments, we kind of held out hope that we weren't, the worst wasn't going to happen, that the precedent wasn't going to be overturned. And I remember going to bed that night thinking like, Wow, I've never lived in a world where the option to have an abortion was not extended to me. I've never lived in that world. What is the world going to look like on the 25th? And I woke up the morning of the 24th and I remember sitting down at my desk and the decision came down and I read it and I read it with such dread and I read it with such you know, just just a, a profound sadness that I think all of us felt. I remember my mom calling me and my mom is 71 years old. And she said, you know, I didn't think that my amazing daughters were going to have to refight the same fight that I fought 
all of the in in my in my in my youth as well. I didn't think y'all were going to have to refight this fight. I yeah, my mom my mom had just graduated from high school in 1970, so she was about to about 21 in 1973, and she said, "I just didn't think you would have to do it anymore." And the more I heard from my aunts and my my friends' mothers, because they knew what work I was doing, I really started to think, this is a moment for innovation. I'm not going to get down. I'm not going to stay mired down in the in the depressed state that I could be in. I'm going to start thinking about the things of how we can undo what's been done, because whatever has been done can always be undone. So what are we going to have to do to make that happen? And I sat down at my computer and I started to think and I started to brainstorm. Let me put a, I'm going to put a quick pin in that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lillian's List. Lillian's List is an organization in North Carolina, as Paloma love, beautifully said, that we are an organization that recruits, supports, and trains emerging leaders to step into whatever space of leadership that they find most valuable. Some may decide to run for elective office. Some may decide to um, step into other organizing spaces. And step into that space, lift your voice, lift the voices of every single person who believes the way you believe and just ca and continue to advocate, continue to fight because the fight ain't over. Trust and believe. It may, difficult takes a day, and impossible takes a week. And what that says to me is that there's no time frame for how we get how we get a problem how we get a problem fixed. Because remember, whatever has been done can be undone. I want to thank you guys so much for this space. I want to thank you guys so much for this time. I think we've got so many things to talk about. I've seen a lot of really great questions come up in the chat. I can be found, um, I'll, I'll give you the Lillian's List website so that that way you guys can find me and email me. And I would love to carry on a conversation with you. Um, and I would love to just encourage you. If you need somebody to say, yes, you too can run for city council. If I don't, if I don't live in the same state that you live in, I can help you find those resources. You guys are amazing. Thank you for spending this time with me. And thank you for allowing this space for me to just hang out with you. Oh, Montica, thank you so much. Um, just so contagious, your hopefulness and um, just like I was like stirred <laughs> as you were talking. So thank you for being with us. And you're right. There was lots of amazing questions that came into the chat. We have some powerhouses here with Danielle, Montica, Oriaku. They and I'm like honored that they're still with us. As folks have had questions, can you type anything that like came up for you into the chat um, as we have them? I'd love just like a few minutes for folks to be able to process. Um, and I'll monitor the chat for a second as folks came in. Okay. Awesome. Well, Colleen asking um, a question on inclusivity of how we can be more inclusive for people of all genders who need abortion services. Great question. Montica, Oriaku, Danielle, any thoughts that came up as you hear that question? I can start. Um, I have lots of thoughts on this, but um, you know, one of the one of the things that I usually say is like the language that we use is so important. And so when we're talking about like pregnant people, people have the capacity to get pregnant, you know, um asking people what their pronouns are and honoring mm -hmm. those, you know, mm -hmm. in a real way. Um, and also doing the work to read around uh, reproductive justice, I would say check out Sister Song's website as well mm -hmm. um, and look at the actual definition of reproductive justice. It's one of those things where when I think about our collective liberation, it's not collective liberation for some, it's for mm -hmm. all of us, which requires us to be truly inclusive. Um, but I'd love to hear what other folks think and have to say. 
Yeah, I'll piggyback on that. I, I think um, language is so important. I think, you know, Oyaku just totally nailed it. Like birthing people, um, mm -hmm. people who can, you know, pe people who can give birth. Those, those use it for us to use those terms and for us to really make those a part of our lexicon is super important because if we can start to use it and we can normalize that language, then it will be, it, it will become a little, one, it'll become easier for people to be more comfortable with it. And um, it, it'll, it'll, it'll just become very, you know, it becomes second nature. Yes. Thank you, Montika. Thank you, Oriaku. Um, lots of, uh, energy in the chat around like folks in office that represent women being in places of power, um, which we love and, um, how to get started running for office from zero. Great question. <laughs> I'm trying to tread the line between like explicitly, this is a C3 ball <laughs> being like, go here, go here, go here lots of groups we can give you information on, on how to like connect and start running for office locally. Um, cause that matters a lot. Okay. Awesome. Looking for any other questions in the chat. Okay. Liz, yes. I dropped my email in the chat. I, I think it, that's probably an offline question, like how to get started from zero. Um, whoever asked that question, go ahead and just drop me a, drop me an email. Um, excuse me, Lillian's list has a lot of information that we can, we can give you. It's going to be more North Carolina centric, but a lot of the info, what's, what's personal is universal. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, if you want to drop me an email, i uh, just say that you were in this particular conversation and I'll, I'll know who it is. So thank you. Awesome. Um, Montica, thank you so much for that email too. Okay. Final question I see coming in a lot. Um, please don't feel the pressure to answer this. It feels too on the spot. There is lots of questions around the medication abortion status. If any folks on this call have ideas on where that's landing right now or hopefulness as it's being like all tied up in the courts, like, do we do anything now? Um, anything with that? Might be an offline question as well. Yeah, the only update that I have um, is that we're still waiting mm. on what is happening. We're still waiting for them to make a decision. We're still waiting for what's happening. It could happen at any point. So, mm. you know, it really is important to just keep an eye, keep an ear um, to the ground. And yeah, I would say tap into local um, mm organizations as well that are doing reproductive health rights and justice work is, because it could look different in every state as well so yeah all right I see Jared's question I could answer oh, please take it I feel like now. there's no questions I could answer but uh <laughs> how do we support people in the south who are seeking abortion care and healthcare system that is already failing everyone um, and what we always talk about is um, getting involved with your local abortion funds, um, because you're going to find a way in that way on how you can um, donate, I'm sorry, volunteer your time, uh, volunteer funding. You can see what the process is actually like for somebody who has to get an abortion that can't get it in their state. What does it look like to get that person to another state to have that process done? So that was a great question. Great. Okay. Well, Oriaku, Danielle, Montica, thank you so much. We didn't even like give you a heads up that we're going to be asking Q&A, but I was like, oh, the collective like wisdom of the three of you. I was like, we can't not <laughs> have a moment. So thank you for being flexible and adaptable. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, okay. So with that, I'm actually going to pass to Paloma and we're going to close out with some key ideas to leave with from this call. Thank you so much, Liz. And I see Amelia is talking about um, clinic escorts. I used to run a program out here in Illinois and we had over a hundred folks. Um, I remember when I opened in my hometown it was, okay. anyway, if you do have the capacity to be a clinic escort, it is 
is incredibly rewarding um, and you get training, make sure that you're trained <laughs> before you do that. So some key um, ideas that we want you to walk away with is we are working to create a world um, where our bodies are respected, which means that the healthcare system takes our needs seriously from medical treatment to making decisions about if and when to start a family. A year after Dobbs, access to abortion care has become increasingly dire, and that's particularly true for folks in the South and for Black and Indigenous people. And in particular, access to medication abortion, specifically mifepristone, is currently in jeopardy, which would further inequalities to abortion access. And then finally, we all have the resources that we can use to make sure that people are able to access abortion care. And we're going to go through um, a little bit of a resource inventory just now. Um, so over to you, Liz, to lead us in that. Okay. So as we close out, we hear like lots of folks asking, what do I have personally to make a difference? What can I do? Um, we think that's a time for reflection and then action. So in your, on your worksheet, there's a series of questions that asks you to go through from a scale of one to five, one being, I have limited access to that resource. Five being, I have lots of access to the resource. Ask about, do you have money to give? Do you have time to give? Do you have folks you can organize? Do you have social media accounts, with followers? Do you have specialized knowledge? So there's a series of questions. And we just ask you to rank um, yourself on one to five and then look at the top three things that you have access to and commit to taking action with those things. Um, so there, um, we're gonna drop two links for you as you go through that reflection. Um, there's an interactive map of access that I look at sometimes to see what's going on in states, to see what's like moving, what's changing. We're going to drop that for you. And then the second thing is there's a practical support group. There's a list um, of groups that you can go to follow. And like at minimum, we would love you to commit to um, working with Oriaku, with Montica, with Danielle, with these three powerful groups that are all committed in national and in local ways to support folks and getting access to the care that they need. Um, so there are like actually too many actions you could take, like commit to at least three things that you can do tonight as you go through that worksheet and find out what works for you and your time um, and your finances and know that we're, that we're all in this together. So we have absolutely loved being with you tonight. There's a few things as we close. One, uh, we have an evaluation of how Paloma and I did. Please let us know how we did. We always want to do better. There's always ways we could get better. So we're dropping that evaluation in the chat and we like fundamentally change every time based on your feedback. So please, please, please fill that out. Um, the second is that if you were like, Liz, this is a lot of information. I want to access it again in the future. I am really excited to, for you to do that. We have a website for the recordings that we're going to put um, from our whole speaker series up. Um, and we'll drop that in the chat as well. And then finally, um, tweet out any of your learnings using the hashtag majority leaders. And we want to see what you're, what you're growing, what you're shaking on. Um, next week, we're diving into the majority rule. Our work is valued with a specific focus on contemporary labor issues facing young folks. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be so good. Um, and we're just really grateful for everyone on this call tonight and the community that you've created. So with that, thank you so much for joining and we will see you in two weeks. Bye everyone. me dance, dance the night away, my heart could be burning but you won't see it on my face, watch me dance, dance the night away, I'll still keep the party running, I want it out of place, lately I've been moving close to the edge, still be looking my best, I stay on the beat, you can count on me, I ain't missing no steps. Every romance shakes and it bends, don't give a damn. When the night's here, I don't do tears, baby, no chance. I could dance, I could dance, I could dance. Watch me.
Catch me.